20 years ago, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 caused two former foes, the U.S. and China, to become friends. That was in order to fight the war on terror. But just how sincere was the Chinese regime in its motivation? And what cost did the U.S. pay after taking the Chinese regime's word for it? In a new special report, we look at the Chinese regime's history of supporting terrorist groups, despite vocally condemning them in front of the West, and what the regime is ultimately working toward. Welcome to China In Focus, I'm Tiffany Meyer. The year is 2001, and the Chinese regime remains the last major communist country standing. That's following the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Soviet Union. At that time, China was struggling to avoid international isolation and trying to figure out how to deal with the George W. Bush administration, which had vowed to take a tougher line with the Chinese regime than Bush's predecessor. U.S.-China relations hit their lowest point in decades after a U.S. spy jet and a Chinese fighter jet collided that April. The U.S. was ready to take on the Chinese regime. Then 9-11 happened. The tragedy led to a 180-degree change of course for U.S.-China relations. Uh, I was privileged to be in the White House before, during, and after 9-11 to sort of see these uh, policies and plans coming into action and then changing dramatically. Uh, for those of us that followed Asia or the China challenge as a, as a key priority, it was a little bit frustrating because uh, the war on terror took a higher priority, and there was a good argument for that. The Chinese regime didn't hesitate to declare it shock at the incident and quickly express sympathy to the U.S. And America took Beijing at its word. President Bush soon visited China in October and affirmed that there was no hesitation, no doubt, that the Chinese would stand with the United States and its people during this terrible time. But the Chinese regime's actions over the past two decades have led some to question whether it acted as part of the solution or part of the problem. In this special report, we look at the Chinese regime's history of supporting terrorist groups, despite vocally condemning them when democratic countries are looking and what it's ultimately trying to achieve. The Taliban is not a U.S.-designated foreign terrorist organization, but it was designated by the United Nations as a terrorist group. During its brief years in power, the Taliban set infidels on fire, performed public execution, tortured ethnic and religious minorities, amputated limbs from people who committed misdemeanors, banned women from receiving education, and most recently, started searching door to door to find people who had worked for the U.S. and Afghanistan's government and take revenge on them. After 9-11, the Taliban harbored its ally, Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden, and refused to hand him over to the U.S. The organization is also part of the international illicit drug trade circle. The drug trade accounts for up to 60 percent of the Taliban's annual revenue, earning the group up to $400 million every year. The Chinese Communist Party's ties with the Taliban started decades ago. The same day the World Trade Center fell, the Chinese regime signed an economic cooperation deal with the Taliban. And after 9-11, the UN Security Council voted to ban arms sales to the Taliban unless it shut down bin Laden's terrorist training camps. But China abstained. Since then, Beijing continued secretly negotiating with the Taliban. And in 2001, Indian intelligence officials were quoted by the media, alleging that Chinese tech giant Huawei helped supply communication surveillance equipment to Taliban forces in Afghanistan. China's Huawei has a history of violating U.S. sanctions and of doing business with authoritarian regimes like Iran. That's according to allegations from the U.S. Justice Department and several investigative reports from Reuters. Quoting anonymous U.S. intelligence officials, the Washington Times reported that two years before 9-11, Huawei worked on Kabul's telecom system. Huawei in Beijing denied the allegations. And China's support continued well after 9-11. The BBC reported in 2007 that the British Army found made-in-China weapons in the aftermath of Taliban attacks on British and American troops. Those arms included Chinese missiles, anti-aircraft guns, landmines, grenades, and components for roadside bombs. 
More recently, the Chinese regime has become less shy about its relations with the Taliban. China's foreign minister welcomed Taliban leaders with open arms this July, weeks before the terrorists' lightning takeover of Afghanistan. Then in August, news pieces whitewashing the Taliban started appearing in state media reports. A Chinese Communist Party advisor even compared the Taliban to the Chinese regime's own military, which Beijing's propaganda portrays as the savior of the Chinese people. Wang Yizhi is an influential professor. His book was praised by Communist leader Xi Jinping and even designated as a required reading for Communist Party officials. Taliban, this is not a example. It's like the Vietnam War, it's like the Vietnam War. The People's Liberation Army is the official name for China's military. Wang went on to describe the Taliban as having been demonized by the U.S. In a subsequent video, he argued that just like how the Chinese military represents the will of the Chinese people, maybe in the future in Afghanistan, the one that can represent the Afghan people is the Taliban. Soon after the Taliban took power in Afghanistan, the Chinese regime announced that it would send over $30 million worth of supplies to the country. What's more, Beijing may also be weighing whether to send soldiers to an Afghan airfield in the coming years, the same airfield that was previously occupied by U.S. troops. That's according to a U.S. news report quoting anonymous U.S. officials. That's all for the Chinese regime's Taliban relations. Now let's look to its ties to al-Qaeda. To watch today's full special report, click the link in the description down below. We are working with Epoch TV, and all Friday special reports are published there in full length. The U.S. Justice Department has reached an agreement that will allow Huawei CFO Meng Wanzhou to return to China. Meng will also be allowed to leave Canada from December 1, 2022, and the United States will withdraw its extradition request to Canada. NTD's Don Ma has more. Meng Wanzhou, chief financial officer of Chinese telecom giant Huawei, will not be extradited to the United States. She has reached an agreement with the U.S. that will allow her to return to China. Appearing virtually in a New York federal court on Friday, Meng pleaded not guilty to charges relating to bank and wire fraud. Under the deal, the U.S. would put the prosecution on hold until December 2022, and it will drop the case altogether if Meng complies with specific conditions. And as part of the agreement, Meng will be able to leave Canada on December 1, 2022, and the U.S. will withdraw its extradition request to Canada. In 2018, she was arrested at Vancouver International Airport on a U.S. warrant. She was accused of misleading banks in doing transactions that were in violation of U.S. sanctions on Iran. The Huawei CFO has been battling extradition to the U.S. for three years. She has been under house arrest in her Vancouver mansion where she is monitored 24-7. Questions are now being raised that if Meng is returned home, will Canadians Michael Korvik and Michael Spavor be released in China? The two Michaels were arrested shortly after Meng was taken into custody. The arrest of the Michaels are commonly viewed as a tit-for-tat response towards Canada for detaining Meng. Canada has accused Beijing of holding the two hostage in retaliation for her arrest, although China denies that there is a connection between the arrests. Don Ma, NTD News. As part of the agreement, charges against Meng Wenzhou will be dismissed December next year under the condition that she acknowledges wrongdoing. It is also under the condition that she doesn't commit any federal, state or local crime before then. Friday afternoon, Canada's Department of Justice released a statement saying that, quote, the judge released Meng Wanzhou from all of her bail conditions. Meng Wanzhou is free to leave Canada. President Biden today met with world leaders from India, Japan and Australia. The group known as the Quad is working together on security issues such as the global supply chain, climate change and how to handle global threats from the Chinese Communist Party. NDD's Melina Wise Cup brings us the details from Washington, D.C. Today at the White House, President Biden met with prime ministers from Australia, Japan and India for the first time in person. Now, these world leaders are up against a variety of issues and they're vowing to work together on these international security concerns. One of those concerns being how to combat the growing aggression from the Chinese Communist Party. Now, the Chinese government has taken more and more aggressive actions against each of these countries that are here in D.C. today. This grouping of Democratic partners who share a world view and have a common vision for the future, coming together to uh, take on key challenges of our age. One of those key challenges, overcoming communist China's coercive economic agenda. 
India and China are at a standoff in the Himalayas over border disputes, but they have economic ties with India relying on China for COVID-19 vaccines. Now the Quad is working on its own vaccination distribution. The Quad vaccine initiative will greatly help countries in the Indo-Pacific region based on shared democratic values. And Japan is keeping an eye on the increase in Chinese military presence around Japan's waters, while Australia faces a relentless embargo on its exports to China after the country called out the CCP's human rights abuses and called for an investigation on the origins of the CCP virus. I think what's so so enraged Beijing is that a lot of other countries have uh, taken inspiration from Australia on policies such as the banning Huawei, on foreign interference legislation, even the strategic affairs. So we stand here together in the Indo-Pacific region, a region that we wish to be always free from coercion, where the sovereign rights of all nations are respected. Australia, the UK and the US are now putting into action a new defense agreement to protect the Indo-Pacific. It involves the US and UK helping Australia build nuclear submarines as a powerful deterrent to China. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. China's ambassador to the U.S. claimed China is a democratic country, saying its politics exemplifies the ideas of former U.S. President Abraham Lincoln. Qin Gan made these remarks on Wednesday in a virtual conference organized by U.S. think tanks. Qing cited Abraham Lincoln's famous of the people, by the people, for the people address, claiming that China's people-centered philosophy is also for the sake of the people. And he claimed that the values of some Western countries, such as the U.S., quote, don't represent the international community. He also said the U.S. should be less hostile when working with China. Qing's speech triggered heated discussion among Chinese people. One netizen commented, with democracy, there is not only one party always governing. Another one questioned, does China have universal suffrage? A third one asked, can Uyghurs in Xinjiang be interviewed by foreign media without restriction and surveillance? A Chinese diplomat had unified political parties in Sweden, but not in a usual sense. Now that he's leaving the country, it seems very few people will miss him. China's ambassador to Sweden, Gui Tsong Yo, is about to step down. The Swedish media said it was rare to see such an undiplomatic diplomat and that the Swedish political parties were united in his expulsion. According to Radio Sweden, Gui is leaving office on Friday, and his successor is expected to come by the end of this year. The Chinese embassy confirmed his departure. The embassy told another media outlet, Expression, that Gui is packing. But an official announcement is yet to be released. Since taking office in 2017, Gui has repeatedly threatened Swedish journalists, politicians, think tanks and even the government. He's seen by the Swedish media as a threat to democracy and the freedom of speech. Multiple political parties urged the Swedish government to expel him this April, after he again threatened reporters. A commentary says not many Swedes will miss Goy, and that Sweden should not expect any better from Goy's successor. We've known for some time that Beijing doesn't like cryptocurrency, and just today the Central Bank of China came out with an official statement banning cryptocurrency deals in the country. Here's more. China's central bank calls all cryptocurrency deals illegal. It says on its website that cryptocurrency trading breeds criminal activities such as gambling, illegal fundraising, fraud, pyramid schemes, and money laundering. It will severely crack down on illegal financial activities related virtual currencies. I don't think it will necessarily kill off cryptocurrency use within China. The cryptocurrency market for the Chinese will effectively move more towards the, the, the black market, quote unquote, and we'll see lots of that happening. There are VPNs out there that could just uh, that, that could hide things. Rob Chong is the founder of Griffin Digital Mining. He says people have already known that China is moving away from cryptocurrencies and pushing its own digital yuan. And, and even then, I think without China, it doesn't matter. The, the, the global uptake for cryptocurrencies is something that's been let out of the barn and you can't get them all back in anymore. Senator Pat Toomey tweeted that the crackdown on crypto is a big opportunity for the U.S. Jahan Jamali, the co-founder at Sarsen Funds, agrees. We'll continue to see the infrastructure for cryptocurrency investing and cryptocurrency mining navigate out of uh, places where there are uh, increasing restrictions like China and more into places like Texas and Wyoming. However, current SEC chair Gary Gensler has an unfavorable view of crypto. 
He said Tuesday that he doesn't think there's long-term viability for five or 6,000 private forms of money, and that it's worthwhile to have an investor protection regime placed around this. Faye Quarter, NTD News. Chinese real estate group Evergrande is inching closer to defaulting. It could happen in just a few weeks. On Thursday, the group missed a key deadline to make an $80 million repayment to overseas investors. The company now has a 30-day grace period to make that payment. If Evergrande still doesn't pay up, it's going to result in default. In addition to evading the outstanding payment, it looks like the group is keeping creditors in the dark, staying silent while the deadline passed. The company's collapse could pose dire consequences to China's financial system. Some speculate the Chinese state could step in before that happens. But it looks like some Chinese citizens are against the idea. First, Evergrande must save itself. It should not be the case that Evergrande only makes money but then asks the government to save its life. <laughs> Chinese authorities have generally stayed quiet about Evergrande's situation, and China state media offered no clear position on the matter. The U.S. audit watchdog has a new rule aimed at protecting American investors. It could see hundreds of Chinese companies delisted from U.S. stock exchanges. If a company is headquartered in a place where authorities don't let businesses comply with U.S. law, then the company will just be considered non-compliant and could be delisted. It didn't specifically mention China, but it is a fact that Chinese authorities don't allow firms to open their books to U.S. auditors. They call the accounts state secrets. Around 250 Chinese companies are listed on the U.S. stock exchanges, with a total market cap of $2.1 trillion. The Chinese regime won't allow their companies to open their books to U.S. auditors, but they are asking them to share data with the regime itself. China Central Bank will soon have access to the private credit information of hundreds of millions of users of Ant Group's online credit service. Ant Group's credit service says its consumer credit data will be added to the database of China Central Bank. Consumers who don't authorize the sharing of their data will not be able to use the credit service. The move is part of stricter regulations for Ant Group. Ant Group operates many digital payment, investment and insurance services and has over a billion users worldwide. In China, about 500 million people use its online credit and consumer loan services. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching, but before you go, we will give you a glimpse into next Friday's special report. A statement from China is suggesting you are more likely to get struck by lightning than to experience adverse reactions from Chinese-made vaccines. But a number of reports appear to say otherwise. Many Chinese citizens have already reported adverse symptoms after getting the jab. After the vaccination, I felt uncomfortable in my heart. It was arrhythmia and slight fibrosis of the heart. I think my blood circulation isn't flowing properly because of the vaccine. China state-run media doesn't seem to be reporting on these cases either. So in this next special report, we look into unreported stories of those who say Chinese vaccines aren't so harmless after all.